everyone, this is Andy from Med School EU, and today we're going to continue on with the topic of bioenergetics, and more specifically, we're going to take a look at aerobic respiration. So in the previous video, we went through the process of glycolysis, which is the first stage of uh, cellular respiration, and we're going to have to decide where the products of glycolysis go. So what is the path of glycolysis products? and where do they turn and where does the cellular respiration continue uh, with certain conditions. So what we have is we have our mitochondria, of course, the double membrane system here. And this is our pyruvate that we've made through the process of glycolysis. So we're gonna label this as pyruvate. Pyruvate. It's the three carbon molecule, and it's of course, it's made in the cytosol or the cytoplasm uh, where the process of glycolysis occurs and the product of glycolysis is two pyruvate molecules. So there's two pyruvate molecules. However, in this, just for the purpose of this slide, we're always gonna take a look at one uh, just to see exactly what happens to it. Now, what is the path of pyruvate from the cytosol Here's the mitochondria inside the cell, and where does this pyruvate go? Well, it could go into the mitochondria inside past the two membranes, or it could stay in the cytosol and not enter the mitochondria. Now, what distinguishes the two processes is that the presence of oxygen. So if we have here, let's, let's pick another color, if we have high oxygen available for the cell so the cell is able to consume oxygen and is able to get oxygen diffused inside its cellular membrane and there's just oxygen molecules flowing around that gives pyruvate products of glycolysis the ability to penetrate the outer and the inner membrane of mitochondria and go into the mitochondrial matrix and of course, this is where cellular respiration happens with the Krebs cycle, which we will go over in this lecture. However, now if, if oxygen is not available or it's in low concentration for the cell, and the best example of having low oxygen presence for the cell is when you're exercising. So when you're doing extremely extraneous exercise, for example, you're doing bicep curls, and during the set of bicep curls, you're not you're not pausing, so you're not you, your muscle does not stop exercising, and you keep going for let's say 30 seconds, 40 seconds. Now during that time, the oxygen supply of the cell is being depleted because it's being used in order to to provide energy for the cell so that it could continue to contract. And once it gets completely depleted, we're no longer using the Krebs cycle and all of and all the, the rest of the cellular respiration uh, methods, we are going to go through something called fermentation. Fermentation. And typically only after you stop your set, so you put the, the dumbbells down and, and you rest your muscle, this is when oxygen actually gets into the, the muscle cell and the oxygen levels rise. And then of course the pyruvate is able to break out of this fermentation and enter into the Krebs cycle or enter into mitochondria to continue on and produce a lot more ATP. However, if it's not available like during a set or during strenuous uh, exercise where you're you're doing at a maximum rep capacity. So it's not something like running because running is submaximal. So you're not exerting all your force for running. When you're running, you're exerting maybe 30, maybe 40% of your maximum force that you can put off with your legs. And therefore, this is why we're able to run for so long because we get a continuous supply of oxygen to those muscles, to those cells, and they're able to go through the process of cellular respiration producing lots and lots of ATP and this is why we can run things like marathons without pausing and we can run even longer distances without pausing. However, if you're doing something like a, your maximum squat, if you're doing your maximum bicep curls, then you're probably going to stop at one or two and you're not going to be able to do a third 
curl because your muscles are simply too tired. You've built up too much lactic acid as a result of fermentation. So the next step in terms of the cellular respiration, we have pyruvate oxidation. So our molecule of pyruvate, of course, this is pyruvate that is in the cytoplasm. It enters the outer membrane by simple diffusion. It enters the inner membrane of the mitochondrion by uh, transport proteins. It uses a symport. It uses a symport uh, tr transport protein where ions are used in order to transport the molecule of pyruvate inside into the matrix of the mitochondria. And this is a secondary uh, membrane transport, secondary active membrane transport. And that's, that's going to go into matrix of mitochondria. So keep that in mind that it goes through the secondary active membrane transport through a process called symport that we've talked about in previous lectures in terms of transport across membranes. Now here, we're gonna uh, discuss the process of pyruvate oxidation. And what this means is pyruvate is, is going to be oxidized, so the loss of electrons is going to occur to pyruvate in order to create another molecule called acetyl-CoA. So let's label this molecule as acetyl A. And let's go through the process what actually happens. So it is combined with an enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And what this pyruvate dehydrogenase does is it takes pyruvate through an oxidation reaction where it oxidizes pyruvate and reduces NAD plus into NADH in order to produce acetyl CoA, two carbon molecule of acetyl CoA and it releases carbon dioxide. So remember, there's two molecules of pyruvate, means there's going to be two acetyl-CoA's entering the matrix or inside the matrix, and there's going to be two CO2's released here. So keep that in mind. So the CoH is simply just another um, molecule that's being added to the, the carbon here as, as it is added right there, and we call it acetyl CoA, coenzyme A. Now, of course, NAD plus goes through reduction into NADH. Whenever we add a hydrogen, we go through reduction. Now, of course, the, the pyruvate goes through oxidation reaction where it's losing electrons and uh, we end up with acetyl-CoA molecule. And this is what enters, then goes into something called a Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle. And all of this, all of this process, the pyruvate oxidation and the Krebs cycle, it all occurs in mitochondrial, mitochondrial matrix. So our acetyl-CoA molecules have entered the citric acid cycle, or we call it Krebs cycle. And uh, let's discuss what happens at each of the steps. So step number one, we have the two carbon acetyl-CoA. So we're gonna take a look at this whole cycle in terms of just the one acetyl-CoA molecule. But remember, we have two acetyl-CoAs entering per glucose molecule. So glucose goes through glycolysis, which produces two pyruvate. Now two pyruvate are converted to two acetyl-CoA molecules. And of course, these two acetyl-CoA will enter into the Krebs cycle. However, for the purposes of this video, we're simply just gonna look at one and go through the process. However, you, um, you must know and you, you should imagine that the acetyl-CoA would go through this twice. So what, what happens in our first step is that the acetyl-CoA is being, is being carried into the Krebs cycle it, with uh, the CoA molecule. And the two carbons, the two carbons from acetyl are going to be transferred onto oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate is a four carbon molecule that is uh, the, the byproduct of the citric acid cycle. Every cycle finishes with oxaloacetate. And oxaloacetate will combine with the two carbon acetyl uh, to make a molecule called citrate. Now citrate has six carbons. We combine the four carbons with two making six carbons and the CoA 
is disassembled from the acetyl group and the CoA simply remains in the matrix for the next acetyl or for the next pyruvate to come in and be able to attach through. Now this whole uh, attachment and this, this entire synthesis of citrate is gonna go through an enzyme called citrate synthase. And keep in mind that every single enzyme that is mentioned, almost every enzyme that is mentioned in this cycle will have the first, the first name of it will be the name of either the reactants or the product. In this case, it is the product since it's citrate and it's synthase. Synthase meaning it is, it assists in the synthesis of citrate. And the synthesis will simply be the addition of oxaloacetate to the acetyl group, making it six carbons. The next step, our citrate molecule is going to be uh, is going to become isocitrate, which is another six carbon molecule. And this citrate is simply rearranged into its isomer. So the isocitrate is an isomer. Isomer meaning that it is the same chemical formula, but the bonds are arranged differently. And this is done through an enzyme called uh, aconitase. Now moving on to the next step, this is where things begin to get very interesting in terms of the, the Krebs cycle is what we have our isocitrate six carbon molecule is going to be converted into alpha ketoglutarate, which is a five carbon molecule. Now keep in mind, each time that we go down a carbon, we lose a carbon from our cycle, it is lost in the form of CO2. So here we, we have the production of CO2. As you know, the byproduct of cellular respiration is is a carbon dioxide and this is where it comes from we we get these carbon dioxides from uh, oxidizing the molecules in the Krebs cycle and this is the first part of it here so isocitrate is being is is going to be oxidized into alpha ketoglutarate and because this is an oxidation reaction dehydrogenase remember performs oxidation reactions because this is an oxidation reaction, there must be a, re, uh, a uh, reduction reaction making a redox, correct? So the redox reaction will be that NAD plus is going to be reduced into NADH and a proton. So this is where we produce our first electron carrier within the Krebs cycle. And this is all done through isocitrate dehydrogenase. Moving on to the next step, the alpha ketoglutarate is going to be further oxidized into succinyl CoA. So another CoA mo molecule will come in and be attached to a four carbon molecule called succinyl. Now keep in mind, each time we lose a carbon from our oxidation reaction, we're gonna get the carbon dioxide out of it. So again, we produce a carbon dioxide here. Now, because this is an oxidation, because we use another dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase specifically, we have a reduction reaction of NAD plus into NADH and a proton. And again, we produce another electron carrier for our further reactions. Moving on into the next step. So just pay attention to this side of the equation. What we have is from succinyl CoA, the CoA, uh, the coenzyme A is going to uh, dissociate, it's going to break off, and we're going to end up with just a molecule of succinate, which is another four carbon molecule. We did not lose any carbons, therefore we did not lose any, uh, we did not produce any carbon dioxide. Now the interesting thing is that the release of CoA from Susanil CoA produces succinate and the energy released converts GDP to GTP. So because we are releasing this CoA molecule from Susanil CoA, because of the release here, it produces energy. And this energy is basically harvested by GDP and an inorganic phosphate combining these, producing a molecule of GTP and GTP is another molecule of energy however this GTP is then further converted into ATP and this is the only ATP made directly by the citric acid cycle so we, we're gonna see that these electron carriers NADH will make lots and lots of ATP molecules uh, later on 
However, for now, we must know that the citric acid cycle does produce ATP directly, and here's the method. So we must know this is direct production of ATP, and this is the only direct production of ATP in the citric acid cycle, as it produces one ATP per acetyl-CoA molecule. So if there's two acetyl-CoAs, overall, each glucose molecule will produce two ATP molecules. Moving on to the next step, we have another oxidation uh, with the dehydrogenase. We're going to uh, succinate dehydrogenase. So the succinate is going to go through an oxidation reaction and it's going to lose electrons, which then the FAD will become FADH2. And this is another electron carrier molecule, just like NADH, that we're going to use in our next step. And here we don't have a loss of carbon even though we go through oxidation. However, what what is removed is two protons and two electrons from the succinate. And because we have a removal of electrons, we're going to have a removal of protons and these two protons will be added on along with the electrons to the FAD molecule having it reduced and therefore the succinate because it lost electrons becomes fumarate still with four carbons but it is oxidized because it has lost electrons. The next step is a hydration reaction because we have the addition of water into the uh, uh, molecule, into the equation. And what we have is the fumarate is going to be converted into malate and this is uh, just another uh, isomer of, of, of fumarate. It's just going to isomerize it through an enzyme called fumarase and we'll convert it into malate molecule. Again, the four carbons still remain. And finally, the in the last step, the malate is going to go through malate dehydrogenase. And this dehydrogenase, again, is going to oxidize the malate and take away an electron and a proton, making it oxaloacetate with four carbons. And the NAD plus will become NADH, the reduced form. So overall here, what we have is that one acetyl-CoA molecule will produce one, two, three NADH, one NADH, FADH2, and one ATP. Now, if we put through two molecules of acetyl-CoA, then of course, everything will be multiplied by two in the citric acid cycle. So this will conclude the video for today. I decided to split the lecture on aerobic respiration into two parts. So in the next part, in part two, we're gonna take a look at how our molecules of NADH and FADH2, our electron carriers, are going to be oxidized and used in the electron transport chain in order to produce lots and lots of ATP through the process of oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmosis. Thank you.